is risen. Welcome to this Easter Sunday service. It's a great joy that we can gather together and celebrate and be reminded of the glory and the wonder of Jesus is alive. Jesus died, but was raised to new life. And because of that, the world is never going to be the same again. As we gather for worship, I'd like to read some selections of words from Psalm 118. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let all Israel repeat, His faithful love endures forever. The strong arm of the Lord is raised in triumph. The strong right arm of the Lord has done glorious things. I will not die. Instead, I will live to tell what the Lord has done. The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is wonderful to see. Let's pray. Dear God, I just pray that as we gather for worship today, I pray, Lord God, that there would be a wonderful sense of your presence being with us. You are alive. You are risen indeed. You are here with us now. And may we, through this service, become even more aware of your life with us. Be with us as we journey through this service of worship. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And amen. A reading for today is John chapter 20, verses 1 down to verse 29. This is the story of the resurrection. Uh, That should be no surprise that that's the Bible reading on this particular Sunday. The story of the resurrection. And let's read together the wonderful story that we have come here to remember and to celebrate today. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Because they have taken away my Lord, she replied, and I don't know where they have put him. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go and get him. Mary, Jesus said. She turned to him and cried out, Rabboni, which in Hebrew, which is Hebrew for teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus said, for I haven't yet ascended to the Father, but go find my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them his message. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven, but if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands or put my fingers into them and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and look at my hands. 
Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. It's been said that in the world nothing is certain but death and taxes. And a certain wag added to that line, yeah, but at least death doesn't get worse every time the government sits. Today on Easter Sunday, we reflect on a great mystery. Death, which is that great and final absolute that none of us can overcome, lost its grip on Jesus and lost its power to hold him down. I want you as a congregation to place yourself in that room. I want you as a congregation to place yourself among the disciples who had witnessed Jesus' death and had witnessed his burial. You know know that he was dead and you know that he was buried. And here you are sitting in a room together, grieving the loss of this, not just dear friend, but teacher and example and inspiration, someone who you believe was actually going to be the hope for your life and you even believe the hope for the nation and now... He is dead. Imagine you're one of the disciples. Why do you think the disciples were surprised to see Jesus standing in front of them? Just give me, just feel free just to call out an answer. Give me a couple of words. Why were the disciples surprised to see Jesus standing in front of them? The doors were locked. Absolutely. What else? He was dead. Thank you for stating the obvious. He was dead. Once, you, once someone's dead and buried, you don't expect them to come up, but come up in front of you, even if the doors are locked. Like, yeah, lock, lock doors all you want. You're still not expecting anyone to unlock the doors that you want. Open them up. Open up all the windows, but you're still not expecting that a dead person would appear in front of them. Once again, continue just imagining that you're one of the disciples. How do you think the disciples felt Uh, The moment this Jesus apparition, this Jesus figure, this Jesus thing suddenly appeared in front of them. What do you think they felt in that moment? Or maybe I should ask, what do you think you would have felt in that moment? A haunted joy. A haunted joy. Wow. Caleb's taken us deep real quick there. Who are you going to call? (laughs) Who are you going to call? Thank you for that Ghostbusters reference. Really appreciate that. Confusion. Yeah, confusion. I want to spend a few minutes today looking at the story of the resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of one of the characters we just read about, a guy by the name of Thomas. But of course, he's come down through history with a bit of a title, maybe a bit of an embarrassing title. How would you like to be known for all of history with this title, Doubting Thomas? I'm not sure I'll be proud of that. 2,000 years later, I'm doubting Stephen. I was like, thanks for that. Appreciate that, you know. I ask one question and I get labeled with it for life, you know, thanks for that. But he's come down to us as the guy called Doubting Thomas. And I actually want to spend a few minutes reflecting on his doubt. I want to spend a few minutes considering the wrestle that he had to go through as he was confronted with this Jesus who suddenly appeared in front of him on this Easter Sunday, or no, let's be more accurate, the stories he heard of Jesus appearing to his mates on Easter Sunday, but he wasn't there, and then having to process these ridiculous sounding stories himself and his particular journey on the way through. Thomas is one of Jesus' 12 closest followers. So of everyone who knew Jesus, he was one of the people who was closest to him. But he's one of those people in the, uh, in the story of Jesus whose voice we very rarely ever hear. He hardly ever speaks. Uh, so he's kind of one of the background group. You know, there's like a hot three, which are the you know, three closest, and then there's a small group of about two or three others who you hear a bit more of. And then there's like six or so that just sort of are tucked away in the background and you learn next to nothing about And Thomas was one of those six people sort of tucked away in the background who were just there, but you didn't really hear many of their stories. Matter of fact, his one claim to fame, it's a bit of an interesting story. Do you you remember when Jesus' friend Lazarus died? And Jesus goes to raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, Jesus had been in Jerusalem. The Jewish leaders had got very mad at Jesus. He's about halfway through his ministry. And they had dragged Jesus out of the city and picked up stones to kill him. And Jesus had just walked through them and then walked off and headed away. But it had been a life-threatening moment for Jesus and for his disciples, including Thomas. And they had gone about 150 kilometers north 
And they're up there in a place called Bethany, and it was up there in the north, and there was, there was news then that Lazarus in Bethany, which is near Jerusalem, so 150 kilometers back south again, had died. He was a close family relative, and Jesus wanted to go visit him. Guess what all the other 11 disciples said to Jesus when Jesus said, hey, how about we go back to that place where we nearly got killed? Let's just say there wasn't a, a, a whole lot of enthusiasm. They actually kind of said, no, no, let's, let, let's look. He's, as a matter of fact, what they said is, he's dead. Just leave him, you know, what's, what's the point? He's dead. And that's where Jesus famously said, no, 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 he's, he's sleeping. We, you know, we can wake him. And I thought, this guy's nuts. Not only does he think he can wake a dead person, but he's going to go back to a place where he himself almost got killed. Well, Thomas was, the, was the, the, the only one who spoke up. And I love what he said. He said, all right, all right, let's go to... You think, well, it's great. A bit of faith, a bit of confidence in Thomas. You know, let, let's go to... This is John chapter 11, verse 16, for those of you already jumping in your Bibles. Let's go to... So we can die with Jesus. It's like, oh, I thought you had all... The, and then, no, okay. So, it's slightly a morose sort of response by Thomas. Oh, well, oh, guess we'll go. And we'll die as well. It's like, oh, great. So this, this is about the only insight we have in the personality of Thomas before we get to this moment in which he is confronted with the reality of Jesus. Um, and I find him a fascinating person, you know. There's almost that sense of, there's a little spark of faith, but there's also this sense of, of, of uh, whatever will be, will be. All right, well, you know, if it's going, all right. If we've got to deal with it, we've got to deal with it. So we come to the scene in the upper room. The disciples are waiting there. Jesus has appeared to the other disciples. Thomas wasn't there. Don't know why. Maybe he was a bit scared that he might get killed, so he wanted to stay away. I don't know. I don't know what it was. Um, And he hears a story, and he famously turns to the other disciples, and and he effectively, this is sort of my own wording, right? He effectively says, I don't believe you. It's effectively what he says. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were, and put my hand into his side, the place where the spear was thrust into Jesus' side, I will not believe that this thing that you saw was actually Jesus. I might believe you hallucinated, I might believe you saw a vision, I might believe you saw a ghost, I might believe you made something up in the the fervency of your grief, but unless I can physically touch this thing that you say you saw... I will not believe it. Thomas was asking for evidence. He wasn't just accepting the word of the other 11 disciples. What do you think about that? Put your thinking caps on for a minute. What do you think about Thomas' insistence that he touches the body of Jesus before he believes that Jesus is alive? What do you think about Thomas' insistence that he see evidence? Before he believes. It, it's pretty rational. It's pretty rational. He was very realistic. Yeah. He gets, he gets called Doubting Thomas, but I'm wondering sometimes if that's an unfair label to give him. I'm wondering if actually in this moment he was being about the most rational and reasonable person you could possibly be. I'm trying to recover a bit of Thomas's reputation. He's just doing some work on it. He doesn't think that highly of his 11 mates either, does he? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what he thought they were on. Following on from that, he might have thought that they were having him on. Yeah. If it's too good to be true, then it is. Ties into the messianic secret, like lots of people not getting it, who should be getting it. So Jesus had actually been telling them that he was going to rise from the dead. Right? We, we call it the messianic secret, but it wasn't much of a secret because Jesus kept telling everyone. The problem is nobody believed him. Because nobody comes back from the dead. And when Thomas is standing in this moment when his own mates are telling him that Jesus has come back from the dead, like Jesus said he was going to, even Thomas in that moment cannot get his head wrapped around it. For me, I think that Thomas had reached the end of his faith. He could believe in Jesus' teaching. He could, he could walk with Jesus. He could help Jesus to manage the crowds. He could even participate in different ministry events as Jesus instructed his disciples to reach out. But when he had seen Jesus die, when he had seen Jesus buried, he knew that there was no hope of Jesus coming back. He knew that this was the end. And the crazy story from all 10 of the remaining disciples that had seen Jesus, that said they had seen Jesus alive, 
had to be crazy talk. Unless he could make sense of it himself, unless he could touch Jesus and see Jesus alive for himself, then it must not be true. Thomas reached the end of his faith. And then a little miracle happened. Thomas reached the end of his faith and Jesus met him there. Jesus didn't say, ah, you didn't believe, that's it, not, not going to bother any spending any more time with you. Thomas reached the end of his faith and Jesus met him there. Jesus did not reject Thomas because Thomas could not take that next step. Jesus came to, to Thomas in the flesh, physically appeared to Thomas. And in John chapter 20, verse 27, he says to Thomas, put your finger here into my hand wounds. The very thing that Thomas had asked to be able to do, Jesus said, all right, go for it. Come. And then put your hand into my side, that spear wound. Stop doubting and believe. And in that moment, Thomas went, my Lord and my God. And he humbled himself before the greatest miracle that has ever taken place. And Jesus looked at Thomas, and in the hearing of all the other disciples, he said something to him, which I think he also is saying to us. Quote, because you have seen me, Thomas, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. I think these words are spoken to us. We are those who haven't seen. How many of you have had the privilege of putting your fingers into the very wounds of Jesus' hand? Not me. How many of you have had the privilege of putting your hands into the very wound in Jesus' side? Not me. We are those who have not seen. We are those who have not touched. But we gather today because we are those who have been called to believe. I think we are more like Thomas than we are like any of the other 11 disciples. We have heard the reports. We have not seen or touched Jesus. We have heard the story of Easter. But to believe that a man could return from the dead is beyond all of our experience. To doubt such a story is reasonable, rational, and natural. Do you know that to be a Christian, you don't have to believe every crazy story that people tell you? I'm a pastor, I'm also on the internet, I get to see all sorts of stuff, I get all sorts of stuff sent to me, you know, Jesus did this, or Jesus said that, or you know, God did this, or this miracle took place, and sometimes I look at it and go, yeah, that's amazing, and sometimes I look at it and go, yeah, that's crazy. To be a Christian, I don't have to believe in every single miracle that people tell me has taken place. I don't have to believe every single voice, every single word, every single thing that anyone ever says. It's just not what it means to be a Christian. I do not have to believe in every miracle. But to be a Christian, I do have to believe in one. Only one. But I have to believe in one. The miracle that we've come to celebrate on Easter Sunday. That God raised Jesus from the dead. Love John, uh, Romans chapter 10 verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've got one last question, this is to lead us into a bit of a time of reflection. I want you to treat this as a bit of a prayerful reflection question for you. Here's my question. Whether you believe it or not, just go with me on this. Imagine that Easter Sunday is true. Imagine that Jesus was actually physically raised from the dead. If it is true, what difference does Jesus being raised from the dead make to our life? Can even concretize it a bit more. What difference does Jesus being raised from the dead make in our life this week? What difference does it make? Jesus was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. My question is, so what? What difference does it make in our life? Hope. Gives us hope. Can I ask one, one follow-up question which you don't have to answer? Why does it give hope? That there is eternal life. Good. It proves that all that he said was true, so we need to re-look at everything. Yeah. If Jesus, if Jesus was the only one who was able to defeat death, the first 
to be able to defeat death. And everything he said, everything he did, everything he proclaimed, everything he is, has proven to be true because this is the ultimate stamp. Even death was unable to hold him in his grasp. If Jesus was sort of powerful enough to rise from the dead, why the hell would he want to be friends with me? <laughs> yeah, it shifts our relationship. It shifts our relationship with God. If this, is the, if this is who we say God is, not some sort of distant deity sitting on a cloud with a big white beard, looking gla- glaring angry glances down at a bunch of people who are holding lightning bolts in his hand. If actually the revelation of God is one who would humble himself and come and live with us and suffer all that it means to be human, even to the point of death itself, and then show us that there is actually a life beyond death. In Jesus, death is not the end of the story, but there is always life. In in, in our normal, natural world, we think that it's life to death, but in Christ, we know that it's life to death, to life. And that's the great miracle of what we celebrate. I think for each of us, we each have, have the limits of our faith. The point where we say, I trust God this far, but no further. For Thomas, he reached the limit of his faith, at least for a little while, when he was confronted with the reality of the resurrection. Jesus is alive. His response is, no, can't be. And he had to wrestle with that. For each of us, I think each of us also struggle. I trust God with everything but not with my future choices. I trust God with everything, but not with my business. I trust God with everything, but not with my family. I trust God with everything, but not with my money. I trust God with everything, but not with my church. I trust God, and so far. We fear that the God that we worship is a God who wishes to punish or to limit. In effect, we imagine that God is somehow a God of death, and that whatever we give to God, he crushes makes less or smaller. And what the resurrection declares is that God is a God of life, abundant life, life so abundant that even death can't hold it down, and eternal life, life that doesn't just end after a short period of time, but life that goes on. Easter Sunday is the day that reminds us that we are to see the world through the eyes of the resurrection. God raised Jesus from the dead. God defeated sin and death. God showed his power and his love. And if this is true, then nothing is impossible with him. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that we can spend this time reflecting on the wonder of what it means that we can gather here to declare that Jesus is alive. Thank you, Lord God, for what all that that this Easter Sunday is and all that this Easter Sunday means. And I pray, Lord God, that for each of us, wherever we, we may be on the journey of faith, I pray, Lord God, that we would be people who can see with the eyes of faith to a reality to, and to a truth that is far deeper than we can ever fully appreciate or get our heads around. Death is not the final word. Death of relationships, death of careers, death of dreams, death of finances, and even physical and uh, death itself is never the last word in our life because we serve the God of life and we serve the God of the resurrection. And there is always hope, there is always life beyond any form of death that we may experience. May the wonder of this revelation settle on us. And like, like Thomas, may we come to a place, even if it's a bit of a hard journey to get there, may we come to a place of believing and trusting in that one miracle above all other miracles. God raised Jesus from the dead. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go out into this week ahead, may we go out with a confidence that we walk with the risen Jesus. The same Jesus that we read about 2,000 years ago. The same Jesus who was hung on a cross. The same Jesus who rose again on the day that we are remembering and celebrating it today is the same Jesus who walks with us now. May we walk in his living presence each and every day. And as we do that and as we go out from this place, may we each go in peace. Peace.